Uh, so I'm always honoured, I'm so honoured and blessed to come and uh, share with you. And just thank you for uh, uh, thank you for having me this morning. And it's a real privilege um, to be here. Hey, I'm going to uh, quickly pray, and then uh, we'll get into it. Father, we just thank you for the privilege and honour it is to come and um, to be together and to worship you, to honour you. Um, that's so right that we do that because I, I'm convinced you're an amazing Father. You really are. And so to worship and honour you is so right. Um, but we thank you as well for your Word because your Word is so powerful and it impacts our lives and our hearts, great God. And it moves us to action. And I really pray, Father, this morning you would speak to our hearts um, and that as your word goes forth, thank you that it does not return void, but it fulfills its plans and purposes in our hearts. And we just pray that this morning. And so speak to us this morning, great God, and uh, move us to action, Lord. May we be so moved by your word. Uh, and so we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I remember uh, quite a number of years ago now, back when I was in high school, oh, no, not too long ago, it wasn't too long ago, but uh, uh, back in high school and uh, I remember it was probably about grade 10 or grade 11, but we had a particular teacher and she had an interesting, I won't go into details, but she had an interesting uh, last name and uh, she would often get, I think, a little bit teased by this last name. But anyway, uh, this is, sort of, by the way, just um, prefacing, this is like pre-Christian days for me, so um, BC, uh, before Christ. Christ. Uh, but, um, and so I was a bit of a rat bag in high school, but I remember she was calling out the role on this particular day and I made a comment, or I made a, a comment while um, she was calling out my mates, one of my best mates, his, his name. And uh, she was very offended by this and she just assumed that it was my mate who'd kind of made this comment. And she said, how dare you? She spoke to my mate, said, how dare you? Now get over there and I will deal with you in just a moment. And he's like sitting there going, it wasn't me. Like it wasn't me. She didn't, she couldn't care less. She didn't want to borrow it. She said, no, you get over there and I'm going to go and talk to you in just a moment. And uh, my mate's looking at me like, are you going to own up or not? And I wasn't owning up, no way. <laughs> like, and so I just uh, sat there and uh, my mate got in a lot of trouble. But I want to be honest with you this morning, I did feel bad. I must admit, I felt bad. I felt a little bit guilty that uh, my friend got into trouble. Now, if, and I don't, I don't know how much trouble he got into. I'm sure he didn't get detention or anything like that. I'm, I'm hoping that if that was the case, I probably would have stepped forward and said, okay, like I said it, it was me, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, but he, he got in a bit of trouble. And I must admit, I felt guilty about that. I felt really bad. And, and, and I think at one point or another, we've all felt like that at some, at some point in our life. Like we know what it feels like to feel guilty. Uh, we know what it feels like when we, we haven't done something right or we've done, you know, we've just done something wrong. And it could be towards somebody or it could be towards something that we haven't done correctly or we've kind of skewed the truth a little bit. Or uh, we've, we've all felt that feeling of feeling guilty, feeling like we haven't uh, measured up at one point or another. I was just, as I was reflecting on this sermon a little bit, I was just, uh, you know, reading a few different things, but I, I came across uh, a psychiatrist was talking about how, you know, he has all these clients that he deals with and he counsels with and things like that. And he made this interesting comment, and I'm just kind of paraphrasing, but he made this interesting comment saying that if, if the clients that he had, if they knew that they could be forgiven, he reckons 50% of his clients would never have to see him again. That if they just knew that they could be forgiven, 50% of his clients could never come back again and would be probably set free from the stuff that they come to him time and time and time again. And I think part of that is because we know deep down, we know what it's like to feel guilty, but to know that we could be truly forgiven changes everything. It changes everything. And yet the most amazing thing is, is that the Bible indicates that regardless of who you are, and regardless of what you've done in your life, that the Bible indicates so clearly that you can be forgiven. And that can change everything for you. If this morning you come and maybe you're just wandering to church or maybe you've just been coming for a little while or it could be that you've been coming for 20 years, but time and time again you wrestle with some things that have gone on in your past, things that you've done, things that you're not proud of, things that you wish you know, had never taken place, that they, that God Himself, this perfect Father, can forgive you for those things. And that changes everything for us. And, and when we understand our identity in that, we walk with a, just we walk differently. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And so one of, the, one of the things that's interesting about church, and particularly back when I was building and, and I was a tradesman as a, as a chippy and things like that, when I was on site, I often would talk 
to other tradies. And because God had changed my life, I always wanted to, I wanted to tell everyone how good he was. And I would often invite these other tradies to church and things like that. But you know the number one thing that often I would face when I invited uh, these tradies and stuff, they'd say, mate, if I came to your church, the, the whole church would fall in. Like, you don't know my past. And you're, you know this, and you've, you've heard of this. And maybe as you've talked to other people in your street or your workplace, and people just say, there's no way I could possibly walk into church. Why? Because I think all of us to some degree know that we just don't measure up. We feel like we just don't measure up. We just feel guilty. We look at our past, we look at the things we've done. We just think that there's just no way. If there's a perfect God, a good God, there's no way he could accept me. There's no way he could love me. And so I think this is common in our society today, that people just think if there's a good God, there's no way he could love me and accept me. And yet the Bible indicates this is extraordinary. It's not good people that go to heaven. It's not good people. This is so, this is so countercultural. Because in our world today, we just think, oh, well, it's, it's good. And this is what I thought. You know, growing up, I just assumed when my mate asked me and began to talk to me about faith and things like that, I just assumed, well, surely I've been a fairly good person. This God will let me in. But as time went on, I discovered and I began to learn the truth that it's not good people that go to heaven. It's forgiven people. And the Bible indicates this extraordinary thing that if you would be willing, and you'll have an opportunity this morning, But if you would be willing to come and surrender before God and say, God, I need your forgiveness, that he answers that prayer 100% of the time, that forgiveness he offers to every single person, if they were to acknowledge what Christ has done for them, if they were to acknowledge and humble themselves before a holy God, that he would forgive you. And that changes everything. It changes everything. Paul writes about this in Romans 3. And uh, in Romans 3, it's this incredible passage. Romans is, is really, the whole heart of Romans is really about the gospel. And the gospel means good news. It's good news for, for humanity. And he illustrates this so well in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 3. But let me pick up because he describes what I think so many people in our society, in our world, and even maybe you, as you come this morning, maybe you feel the same. Starting in verse 9, he says this. He says, well, then what should we conclude? That we Jews are better than others? No, not at all, for we are already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the Scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one, which is is pretty confronting because often we think, I feel like I've been pretty good, surely this God will let me in. But he indicates here that, that not even one person in this world is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise, no one is seeking God, all have turned away, all have become useless. No one does good, not a single one, not a single person. Even in Isaiah, it talks about even our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Man, aren't you glad you came to church this morning? (laughs) Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. Ever noticed that in our society today? You feel like that's a bit of people just desperately looking for peace, deep inner peace that our soul so desperately requires and longs for. They have no fear of God at all. A word that could be translated instead of fear, you know, uh, it could be respect. They have no respect for God at all. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And so here Paul is describing, basically, it's pretty clear that we all seem to fall short of the glory of God, that we just don't measure up. Honestly, if the entry point, because my mate said to me years ago when I first started to to, to explore this stuff, my mate said, if God says, uh, you know, why should I let you into heaven? What are you going to say? And I just didn't have an answer. And if the entry point to heaven is perfection, there's no way I could be allowed in. And none of us could stand and say, I've achieved that. Like I've successfully done that, that we all fall short of the glory of God. Now, I promise you this morning, this is a good news message, just in case you're thinking of walking out now. This really is a good news message because Paul goes on to talk about, but the grace of God is extraordinary and how desperately we need it in our lives. But this is the problem. Sin is... It's, it's so pervasive, it's, it, it, it's so addictive and, 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 it, and it encompasses so much of our lives, this sin-ridden world that we live in, the sin-ridden life that we often lead. It's, it's full on. 
I remember, um, well, let me put it like this. Um, I have... I think I have an addictive nature. I I don't know. I'm just maybe discovering that now and confessing now. But I I think I have this addictive nature, but particularly when it comes to uh, lollies, chocolate, like it's awful. And I remember on this one particular occasion, my wife and I were going for a walk and maybe it was quite a few years ago because we were just pushing the pram and might have just had only our first child at that time. And we're walking down the road and we were riding to um, Old Gold, uh, the almond Old Gold, if you like the, the dark chocolate, my goodness, we were uh, right into that. And COVID was terrible for me. I was devouring so much chocolate at night, just sitting on the lounge. And uh, I put on so many kilos. My wife has never spoken to me about food except during COVID, when I would open my second packet of pods or Maltesers. And she only once said, babe, do you really think you need a second packet? You know? <laughs> and I said, yeah, like, yes, I do. Like, and so I'd devour a second packet. But uh, it's... Um, it's an awful thing. And I remember walking down the road this time and I was talking about my awful, you know, this chocoholic thing that I've got going on. And, uh, and she'd say, I don't really get it. She'd say, I don't know, why can't you just have a couple of pieces and then just put it away? And I'd say, babe, are you serious? No. <laughs> like, how could you? Like, I was almost offended. Like, how could you say that to me? You don't take an alcoholic to the pub and just say, have one beer, mate, and let's go. Like, you know, I'm, an, I'm a chocoholic. You don't say that to me. Like, you know, I was, I was almost offended. And I said, because for, for me, when I open a packet of Maltesers, I can't just have one or two. I eat the packet. That's what I do. Like, and if I open another one, and the amount of times I've gone to the pantry, right, and I've seen something, because I've learned, I just can't buy it. Like, if I buy it and it's there, I'll just eat it. Like, I'll devour it. It's awful. And at the amount of times I've gone to, to eat something and I've said to myself, don't go there. Like, don't, don't even go there. Don't even begin. And there's something, there's this, like this inner voice that says to me, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just have one. Just have one. And, you know, and, and it always wins. It always wins that voice. And I just take one Maltese or I take a pod. They're generally my favourites. And, uh, and, and I take one. And you know what I do? I quickly wrap up the pack and I put it back and I walk back around. And you know what I think to myself? That was incredible. That tasted amazing. And you know what I do? I walk straight back and I open up and I think, oh, no, no, I'll just, this time I'll just take three. But that's definitely it. And I take out three and then I walk back and I say, that was incredible. And I go back and, and it's this, this, there's something about it. It's so addictive. But you know what? Sins are like that. It really is. Sin is like that. It will, it, it will call you back for more and you just think, no, I can defeat it or I can overcome it or I'll just do it once and I won't go back. But it is so addictive and it will lure you back again and again and again. And the amount of times I think, you know, I won't go there or I won't do that or God, I'm so sorry. You see, this is the problem. We think, oh, no, maybe I can overcome. Why doesn't God just say, why doesn't he just forgive us of our sin and then we move on? Like what, what's the big deal around the cross and Jesus dying on the cross for our sins? Why can't he just forgive us and we move on? Because sin is so addictive. We will continue to keep coming back and saying, God, forgive me again. Oh, forgive me again. Oh, forgive. And he keep forgiving us, keep forgiving us. But the cross deals with it forever. The cross deals with it once and for all. That's the extraordinary thing. And so sin is so addictive. And so time and time again we think, oh, I I can do it. But we can't. We can't overcome it. It's too difficult. It's too hard. It's too too addictive time and time again. And so because of that, none of us, you know, as Paul indicates, none of us can seem to stand right before God. But Paul goes on to say this, and this is the good news. And in verse 21, he goes, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him, uh, to be made right with him uh, without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Now, this seems pretty incredible that we could literally stand right before God, even though we've failed, even though we've fallen short, even though we've sinned time and time again, past, present, and we will probably continue to sin, that God has made a way that we could literally stand in the presence of God with right standing before him. Isn't it an incredible thought that God could look upon you as righteous and clean without blemish? That's an incredible thought. And Paul implies that this could happen, that this can happen. He goes on to say, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. 
So this, we can stand right before God by p- placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And I'll go into more detail on that in just a moment. But what I love about this is he says, it's for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. You see, time and time again, people have come and said, oh, there's just, there's just no way. Yeah, maybe look that other person. And we compare ourselves time and time again to those around us. One of the things that often comes up is that people think, oh, well, maybe I've just got to be good and maybe there's some sort of a standard or level. But there's just, the Bible doesn't indicate that here is the, here's the standard. Like these are the good things that you have to do and then that gives you the entry point to heaven. Yes, he has the law, absolutely. But as we've already heard, the law indicates that you, can, you just can't measure up. And so sometimes what we do is we measure ourselves to others. Well, maybe I've got to be better than that person. But depending on who you're measuring yourself against, you know, that could be so difficult. You may think, oh, I'm better than that person. But then you, you know, compare yourself to Mother Teresa or someone that's given their lives. You think, there's, oh, okay, well, I don't measure up. You know, I'm not better than Mother Teresa. Like, I'd admit that. But the extraordinary thing is this, is that here Paul implies that it's not based on what you have done, uh, not what you can do, but what's been done through Christ. It's his death. And resurrection, his death on the cross and resurrection, but it's for everyone. It's not just for the elite. It's not just for some. It's for every single person. As long as we look to ourselves for assurance that we know that we can enter heaven, then we will always fall short. Time and time again, we will always question. Every morning you'll be waking up thinking, no, I'll do, I'll try better this day. Like, like I said, you know, I've got this addictive eating behavior. It's terrible. I just love food. But you know the amount of times I wake up every morning because I wake up and I've eaten so much rubbish the night before and I have a terrible sleep and I wake up feeling bloated and I think, no, today I'm going to eat better. Today I'm going to eat better. It's true. And you know what happens? I fail again and again. And, and, and that's how it is. If you, if, you know, sometimes that's, that's how it is in our own lives. We think, I'll do better today. I'll do better today. And we fall short time and time again. But what an incredible thing to know that God has made a way so that you don't have to continue to keep failing, but you can simply put your faith and trust in what Christ has done. And to know that you can be in right standing with God, not a daily, just painful trying to be better, trying to be better, trying to be better. As long as you continue to keep trusting yourself, you'll always be wondering, do I measure up? But when you put your faith and trust in Christ, you will never have to wonder again, do I measure up? Because he sees you like he sees Christ. Paul goes on to say in verse 23, for everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace, this is amazing. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. You see, it's by God's grace that we're free from the penalty of sin, the consequences of sin. The Bible indicates that the wages of sin is death. And so what we rightly deserve is death, that there are consequences that need to be paid. But because of Christ, he pays the penalty for us. I deserve to be on the cross. I deserve to be hung there and pay the price for my penalty. But Jesus is extraordinary. The great exchange takes place and he hangs on the cross instead of me. And this is why we come and this is why we worship God because he's right, he's rightly deserves to be worshipped, does he not? What a remarkable saviour. What sort of king would lay down his life like this for us? But this is what King Jesus does. He lays down his life. He becomes the great substitute for us, stands in our place so that we can have right standing with God. And that should change everything for you. If you don't know this this morning, this is amazing. You could come before him this morning and say, I need that for my life. And you know what? All of us do. Every single person in this world needs this for our lives. It changes everything for us. It's absolutely amazing. You know, I came across, um, who wrote the book? Uh, Philip Yancey. Philip Yancey. I, I, wrote, I read an excerpt from Philip Yancey, his book, What's So Amazing About Grace. And he writes this. He says, during a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any, belief was unique to Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities. Incarnation, other religions had different versions of gods appearing in human form. Resurrection, again, other religions had accounts of return from death. The debate went uh, on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. What's the rumpus about, he asked. And heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity, unique contribution among world religions. And Lewis responded, oh, that's easy. It's grace. After some discussion, the conf- uh, conferees had to agree. The notion of God's love coming to us free of charge, no strings attached, seems to go against every instinct of humanity. 
the Buddhist Eightfold Path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant, and the Muslim code of law. Each of these offers a way to earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. It's extraordinary. The mercy of God, His grace is amazing. And so often what we do is we come, and even if you understand this, how often do we fall back into feeling like, oh God, I know it's by your grace, but I just want you to know that I'm doing these things for you as well. And so often we come back and we fall into this trap. And it's like we come with our resume to God. I remember um, quite a few years ago now, after I'd finished my carpentry apprenticeship, and it was quite a horrific time, and I remember just wanting to get out of there, to be honest. I wanted to quit from pretty much year one. Uh, but every, every uh, day I would pray and I'd drive home going, God, there's got, I've got, there's got to be another way. I've got to get out of here. But he said, I want you to stay. And I finished my apprenticeship those four years uh, with my, my bosses. And uh, after that, I went out on my own and started working on my own. And I started doing some jobs to some people. And there was a, uh, I did some, uh, some work for some friends of mine. And I was still working for a little bit of work because I'd just gone out on my own. But I did some work. And uh, they were good friends with a girl that I went to school with that was doing some admin work for her uncle who was a builder. And she'd seen some of the work uh, that I did at, at the, our friend's place. And uh, they said, oh, he's actually looking for work. And she said, well, my uncle's flat out. Like, he's got heaps of work on. He's looking for more carpenters. So she rings me this day and she says, hey, I heard you're looking for work. Do you want to come and work for my uncle? And, you know, she was telling me a little bit about it. And I thought, well, maybe I could go check it out and just contract uh, to, to him uh, as a builder. And so she said, yep. So I talked to him. I rang him. And he said, yeah, sure, look, come in and we'll just have a bit of a chat and stuff. And so I thought, okay, like a bit of a job interview or whatever. And, and so the following Monday I was going in. And so I took in a resume, sort of put it together. I sort of had one there but just updated it a little bit. And I put it together and I, sh- I thought, you know, do I dress up a bit? I don't know. Like, and, but I dressed up a little, probably not too much. You know, I didn't wear a suit or anything like that. But, uh, you know, and uh, I went to go see him. But I was just talking to some uh, mates of mine the other day, just I remember when I went and saw him. And just, just it was such a funny occasion because if you knew my old boss, just one of the most laid back guys you'll ever meet, just incredibly laid back. And so I got to his house. He just has a, you know, home office there and got to his house and I ring him. I'm like knocking on the front door, no answer. And I ring him and he goes, yeah, no, just come down the side. So you go down the bottom of his house, down the side, and he has this office down the bottom. And so I'm kind of like kind of walking over scaffolding and leftover timber from every job site you can imagine for the last 15 years. And, and you know, like his house is just, you know, a mess and all this sort of stuff. And I'm walking through all this stuff and I come down the side and I go in. I think, okay, a bit of an interview here and I've got my resume and I put it down. But it was the, one of the funniest interviews I've ever been to in my life because he just sits there and he's like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. He didn't really ask me about me much at all. And, uh, and then he just grabbed this magazine. It was like this, you know, architectural magazine that you'd see in news agencies and things like that. And he slides that across and he says, these are some of the houses we've built. And he had some of his houses in these architectural, you know, magazines. And he showed me some of his houses. I said, oh, okay, that's amazing. I actually started to feel a bit overwhelmed thinking, okay, I'm only just newly out of my apprenticeship and he's doing these amazing homes. And then he started telling me about some of the jobs that he was doing and things like that. And I said, oh, okay, I was pretty interested in the jobs. And, and then he just said, well, you know, I, I pay my guys this much. And I said, oh, okay. And, and he goes, oh, so when do you want to start, you know? And I hadn't even spoken anything about what I'd done. I hadn't even opened my resume or anything like that. And I said, oh, well, I could start pretty soon. He goes, all right, well, we can put you on this job next Monday. Are you happy with that? And I said, yeah, okay, that sounds great. And I basically left and I thought, I think I'm working for him. I don't know. Like, I think I, I, think I got the job. I, I'm not sure. Anyway, I start with him next Monday. And, like, that was it. And, you know, I, and, and I never even gave him my resume. And I had, you know, all the stuff I'd done. Not that I had heaps of experience, but I talked about some of the work we'd done as an apprentice and the renovations and the new homes and things like that. He never even looked at it. Like, he didn't even look at it. And I think sometimes what we do is we come to, before God with this resume of all the things that we've done. Like, God, check out all this good work that I've done. Honestly, he's not that interested. And, and, and that, that, like I said, Isaiah says that even our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. And we come with this resume before God, like, look at this. He's not interested. It's almost as if he's sliding a magazine across and just saying, hey, regard, I, I don't, I'm not that interested in your resume, but look, what my, look at my son. Look what Christ has done. Check out his life. Check out his death. Look at his resurrection. And that's it. That's the basis of entry point. That's it. Your resume. Don't bring your resume to God. Just bring what Christ has done. Bring that. When you get to the entry point of heaven and God says, Why should I let you in? It's not based on, on who you are, it's based on what Christ has done for you. 
For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for, for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shed in his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do, uh, what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Let me just say that again. He makes sinners, which is all of us, right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Not when we bring our resume. Not when we tell how good God is when we simply believe in Jesus. You know what the cross does? The cross is so significant in so many ways. The death of Jesus on the cross. But one thing it does satisfy is it satisfies the wrath and the judgment of God. We often don't talk about it that much, the judgment of God, but we want to serve a just God. Yes, we want to serve a merciful God and a gracious God, absolutely. But you know what? We want to serve a just God as well. What the cross represents is that uh, justice is, uh, uh, the judgment has been satisfied. The judgment of God has been satisfied on the cross. You see, the consequences of sin is death, that there are consequences to our sin. But what Christ and what cross represents is that uh, the judgment of God has been satisfied as well, which is extraordinary. Like I said before, you see, I deserve death. I deserve to be hung on the cross. But God's judgment is not placed on me. His judgment is placed on Christ and it is satisfied through Christ's death. It's extraordinary. Let me try and explain this a little bit because it's an amazing thing, isn't it? God is just, but he's also merciful. And if you think about it, just or, or, or mercy is getting what you don't deserve. That's the mercy of God. But just is a God who is just is getting what you do deserve. And so how do you bring the two together? How is God just towards you, but also merciful towards you? How does he give you what you deserve, but also uh, doesn't give you what you deserve? At the same time, it's an extraordinary thing. Let me explain this to you a little bit, but I remember many years ago now going for a surf one early morning with my mate. Actually, it was that same mate. I just realised it was the same mate that I got in trouble in class. We still stayed friends, so that was good. Uh, and we were going for a surf early down the Gold Coast of Corumb, and I remember this. And I had my first car that I bought, and uh, not that I'm this old by any means, but it was a 1989 Toyota Hilux four-wheel drive. And... Um, and uh, it was, a, I was going to say, it wasn't a turbo diesel, certainly not a turbo diesel, it was just a diesel, and it was slow as. And my mate, that same mate, was riding the cars at the time, and he was like, you know, uh, what's those movies? Fast and the Furious. He loved Fast and the Furious, and he was going to get all these fast cars and all that sort of stuff. And uh, how many Fast and Furious movies have they done, by the way? Like, is there like eight or something? It just keeps going. Anyway, um, and so he was riding the cars. Now, my car was so slow. Uh, this, this 89 Toyota Hilux four-wheel drive. It was slow, slow, but my mate was riding the cars and he always used to be looking up cars, like how fast, you know, zero to 100 certain cars could get to. And on this one occasion, he was like, we should see how fast your car can get from, you know, zero to 100. And, and I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I remember we were coming out of a fuel station. I just filled up, full of fuel, so ready to go, you know. And, uh, and so we, we stopped at this, you know, where you can just go from, you know, zero to 100. And I just floored it. And I remember him counting on his watch, one, two, three, and I was flooring. I think we were even on a slight downhill too, which was to my advantage. And all of a sudden we got to 100 and I said, stop. And he goes, 31 seconds. And this is how slow this car was, just so slow. And I remember we are going for a surf at Corumban uh, Valley and it was still a little bit dark. The sun was just coming up and we, we stopped at these lights, a red light, and then we left off this red light and we had to go up this hill. Now all of a sudden I see this like orange flashlight wave me down and it's a police officer. And he pulls me over and I'm thinking, what's he pulling me over for? Maybe random breath testing. So he pulls me over and he says, do you know what the speed limits is in this, in this, this drag here on this road? And I said, yes, yeah, 70k, you know. And he says, do you realise that you were going 92 kilometres an hour in a 70 zone? And I said, mate, <laughs> I don't even think my car can get up to 92. Uh, like I said, there's no way you must be mistaken for another car, even though I don't think there was any other cars on the road. And... Um, and he goes, no, no, it was definitely you. And he, he fined me that day for doing 92 in a 70 zone. Now, imagine for a second that I go to court, right? And Because I, I dispute it. And I think, no, I'm just going to dispute this. There's no way it was me. But I go to court to dispute it. 
and the judge, I come before the judge, but by this time I'd cooled down a bit and the judge basically says, okay, here you were fine. We have evidence here that you were fine. You were going, you know, 22K over, uh, 92 in the 70 zone. Um, and, you know, there's a penalty. You'll lose some points, but you also need to pay a fine. It's a hefty fine. It's, you know, $500 fine or whatever it might be. And he says, you know, are you not guilty or guilty? But by this time I've cooled down a little bit and I think, okay, yeah, look, I'm guilty, you know. And so I say to the judge, okay, well, I'm, I'm guilty. And he says, okay, no worries. Well, there's a fine that needs to be paid. It's $500. And so a judge needs to be just, right? The consequences are that that needs to be paid. How can a judge be just but be merciful and let me go at the same time? He can't. He must issue the consequences of what I've done wrong. And so I need to pay the fine, but I simply can't because at this time I just don't have any money or whatever. And I just feel like, well, there's no way I can pay. How am I going to do this? And what I discover in that very courtroom that day, a very good friend of mine walks in and, and uh, Toby, Toby Peacock, my good friend here, he walks into the courtroom in that very, that very moment and he simply walks up to the judge and he pays the price for me. You see, the only way we can have a God who's just and merciful at the same time is if a third party comes in. And this is what Christ has done and so Toby pays the price for me. And because of that, Judgment is satisfied. Do you see that? Judgment is satisfied in that moment. And the judge looks at this and the price has been paid and he says, well, because of that, and he jots this down and the record shows that it's been paid in full. The record shows it's been paid in full and because of that, he says, well, you're actually right to go. Now, I may be leaving and the security in the the, the courtroom may grab me as I'm leaving and say, whoa, whoa, hang on a second. You need to pay the fine that you owe. And I say, well, it's already been paid for. And they say, no, it hasn't been. I I watched you. You never got up. You never paid your fine. You never pulled out your credit card. You need to stay here. I say, no, 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 it's not because of me. It's because of my good friend. And what does he do? He looks up the records. He pulls it up digitally and he sees on his phone, price, it's been paid in full. And he says, okay, well, because of that, okay, you can go. And so in the same moment, the judgment has been satisfied in the same moment I've experienced mercy. And I've experienced grace. And that's, how, that's, the, that's what the cross represents. That the judgment has been satisfied on the cross, but we also ex- receive the mercy of God at the same time. That's how it works. It's because of Christ. When you come to God, you don't say, oh, it's because of what I've done. It's simply what Christ has done for you. It's because of the cross. It's because of the cross. It's an extraordinary thing. And so the Bible says, and Paul says, so can we boast? Absolutely not. You can't boast. Can we boast then that, what we've, uh, that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. You know, the Bible indicates that there's an accuser and this is what he does. He gets in your ear. Even if you know this message, and I know for some of you, you've been walking in this grace for 20 maybe years, maybe longer. You've been walking in the grace of God, but there's an accuser that comes and time and time he reminds us, you fall short, don't you? You've heard it and you've reminded yourself and that, that whisper in the ear and you think to yourself and he says to you, he accuses you, he says, you're pathetic, you, you don't measure up, you, um, you know, you've sinned, you've fallen short of the glory of God. He says that from, you know, to me time to time and get, you know, again and I think, yeah, it's true, it's true, I fall short. But the Bible indicates there's an advocate who steps in our place and that's like a lawyer and Jesus comes and Jesus steps in our place and yes, before God, it looks like we've fallen short but Jesus says, no, hang on a second, Father. Look at the cross and before the cross, you know, the, the playing field, it is, it's flat before the cross. Everyone gets an opportunity. Everybody gets an extraordinary opportunity. And Jesus steps in our place as, as our advocate. And he says, Father, don't look, at, look, don't look at the sins. Look at the cross that's been dealt with. The judgment has been dealt with. That's why he shed his blood on the cross so that we could stand before a holy God, righteous in the Father's sight. I just want to share with you one uh, last thought, a couple of last thoughts. Uh, I just uh, was, I was reminded actually, uh, Abraham Lincoln, there's this story of Abraham Lincoln, the, the great president of the United States. And on this one particular occasion, he went to a slave auction, which sounds pretty horrific in, in our day and age, but a slave auction. And uh, as he went there to this auction, he was uh, impacted by this one woman who was put up on the, uh, on the booth to be auctioned off as a slave. 
And he was so moved and he was horrified by the whole situation. And he began to bid for this woman. And the bidding, and he thought, it doesn't matter what price I'm going to, to uh, you know, win this auction of this woman. And uh, he, he bids and uh, it goes up to bidding and he wins uh, this, this woman who is to become a slave for him. And this woman comes over and uh, he just basically says to this woman, he says, you are free. And she says, what do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, you know, kick, what do you mean I'm free? And he says, you are free to do anything you want, to go to, to whatever, you're free. I've, I've paid and you can, you're set free. And she says, what do you mean? Like, am I free to do whatever I want? He says, you're free to do whatever you want. Am I free to say whatever I want? He says, you're free to say whatever you want. Am I free, she says, to go wherever I want? And he says, you're free to go wherever you want. You are free. And she says, well, if that's the case, then I'll follow you. And that's the amazing thing about the mercy and the grace of God. He says he satisfies all the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Christ does that for us. His mercy and grace is so extraordinary that there's this sense in which I'll follow you. I want to follow you because you're so extraordinary. You're so amazing. I want to read to you just one last story. I came across this that really impacted me, just the grace and the mercy of God. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pray and it says this, uh, this guy describes this moment of adopting this child and how it impacted uh, his life. And he writes this, he says, I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World could be so difficult or that such a trip could teach me so much about God's outrageous grace. Uh, and and just, just for a preface, it's a bit of a long story that I'm reading with you, but I think it's quite uh, impacting. He says, our middle daughter had been previously adopted. So he says this, had been adopted by another family. I'm sure this couple had the best intentions, but they never quite integrated the adopted child into their family of biological children. After a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption and we ended up welcoming an eight-year-old girl into our home. For one reason or another, whenever our daughter's previous family vacationed at Disney World, they took their biological children with them, but they left their adopted daughter with, family, with a family friend, left her behind. Usually, at least in the child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on the trip. And so by the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World and she had heard about the rides and the characters and the, uh, and the parades. But when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one that was left outside. Once I found out about this history, I made plans to take... Um, Sorry, I get emotional so easy, but uh, I made plans to take her to Disney World the next time a speaking engagement took our family to the southeastern New uh, United States. I thought I had mastered the Disney World drill. I knew from previous experiences that the prospect of seeing cast members and freakishly oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow turns children into squirming bundles of, bundles of emotional instability. What I didn't expect was that uh, the prospect uh, that, that the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behaviour in our newest daughter. In the months leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have gained her a snack. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults that were carefully crafted to hurt her older sister as deeply as possible. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her uh, mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our daughter into my lap to talk through her latest escapade. I know what you're going to do, she stated flatly. You're not going to take me to Disney World, are you? The thought hadn't actually crossed my mind, but her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way into the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test several times before. So she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from the most magical place on earth. In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear to my own advantage. The easiest response would have been, if you don't start behaving better, you're right. We won't take you. But by God's grace, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded, brown eyes wide and tear rimmed. Are you part of this family? She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Sure, there may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong, but you're part of our family and we're not leaving you behind. 
I'd like to say that her behaviours grew better after that moment, they, uh, but they didn't. Her choices pretty much spiralled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista. Still, we headed to Disney World on the day uh, we had promised and it was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals and lots of lines, mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. In our, hotel, uh, in our hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted, pensive and a little weepy at times, but her, uh, her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her and held her and asked, so how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down into her stuffed unicorn. And after a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly. Daddy, she said, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't, but it wasn't because I was good, it's because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good, it's because I'm yours. And that's the message of outrageous grace. Outrageous grace isn't a favour you can achieve by being good. It's the gift you receive by being God's. Outrageous grace is God's goodness that comes looking for you when you have done nothing to offer God in return. This is what grace is about. This is that when you come to God, it's not because of anything you've done. It's not because you've been good or you measure up. It's simply by the grace of God. It's simply by the cross and what Jesus has done for you and what He's done for me. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. And there may be some here this morning that uh, maybe they've never heard this before or maybe they know that they've accidentally fallen back into this trap of trying to measure up to You. The extraordinary thing is that in this very moment as we pray, which we're going to have an opportunity to do, in this very moment, as we surrender, lay our hearts before You, we have this amazing opportunity to just put our faith in Christ. And that's all it is, put our faith in Him. And because of that, we can have right standing with You. This morning you come and maybe you've never heard this before. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. This morning you come and you know this message, but you know that you've fallen back into this trap of trying to become better before God or do good things before Him. I want to lead you in a simple prayer that just acknowledges your faith in Christ. Just with eyes closed and heads bowed, if you want to repeat this prayer after me in your head and your heart, you can do that now. Just pray this, dear God, I want to thank you for being my advocate. I want to thank you for being my saviour. I want to thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want to thank you for being the exchange that I desperately needed. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for taking the consequences of death. And thank you for rising again so that I can know life and life to the full. I put my trust and faith in You this morning. Come and fill me with Your Spirit right now. Be Lord and Saviour of my life right now. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You how it changes every part of our lives, great God. And I know that for many of us, we may be familiar with this, but I just pray that this morning that we'll walk out of here with a reminder of who we are in You a reminder of our identity in You, that before You we are in right standing if we put our faith and trust in Christ, that You don't look at us as sin-ridden, that You look at us as pure, white and clean before You, great God. And that when we walk around, we have the authority of You, that we know You, we can have a relationship with You, it changes everything and that You dwell within us and that changes us and compels us to take action. It compels us to tell others about this extraordinary message. And so use our lives, great God, we pray. Move us into action. And we just want to take this opportunity to worship and to honour and to praise a great King who is so worthy of all the honour and praise. We love you this morning, great God. And we honour you and we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.